High energy costs are crippling manufacturers. Here in the UK, we pay some of the highest electricity prices in the world, and that creates serious problems when you're competing with low cost countries. But what might surprise you is this. For many manufacturers, more than half their energy bill isn't for the energy itself. It's taxes and levies designed to push the transition to greener power, but it's industry footing the bill. Faced with rising costs, Airedale Springs tackled the problem head on. They made a significant investment in solar panels and battery storage. We were potentially going to have to find another £100,000 a year. What do we do about that? Let's go and find out what they've done. Airedale Springs is a family-run manufacturer based in West Yorkshire with a proud history going back to 1945. They specialise in precision springs and wire forms used across a wide range of industries. Despite their long-standing heritage, they've built a reputation for staying ahead of the curve. We're here today to meet Chairman Tim Parkinson and see how that forward thing approach is helping them tackle today's challenges head on. Tell me a little bit about Airedale Springs. Where do the springs go? Half the springs that we make are just made for specification. We don't necessarily know where they end up. Those that we do know where they end up, folding bicycles, electronics, EV charging equipment, really anything apart from mass-produced automotive. We do the specialised day. Yeah. So Formula One. Why would I come to Airedale Springs as to other spring companies out there? Probably the skill base that we've developed over the years, coupled with the equipment that we have here, very modern, not a great deal of manual operations required. The wire comes in one end, the finished product comes out the other. We're also the environmental side as well, which is becoming more and more important. For instance, the spring that we manufacture, the energy used to produce it comes from the sun. You've made a big investment in solar and battery storage and energy costs at the minute for industry, pretty high up the political agenda. You've been a little ahead of that curve really. The big thing changed in 2022. We were being quoted prices, potentially going to have to find another £100,000 a year. What do we do about that? Generate our own, put a new system in which dramatically reduced the cost of purchasing energy. What did it used to look like in an energy bill? Well in this particular premises if we would be talking of £60,000-£70,000 a year electricity. On paper it looked like Airedale Springs had made a smart move but in reality the system just wasn't working. The original install fell short and they were left with expensive kit that wasn't delivering. That's when Alphagen Energy stepped in. They didn't just fix the problems, they took over the system and made sure it actually matched the needs of the business. We caught up with Neil Butterworth, Operations Manager at Alphagen, to find out what went wrong and how they got things back on track. We inherited this installation. Originally, the inverters were placed in the battery hut. There was no protocol followed. Every time it got a sunny day, the inverters were overheating. Because they're paralleled, if one went off, it would take all of them out as well at the same time. So we move everything into doors, use the battery hut as a battery hut, which it was spent for originally. I guess this is a more controlled environment, not being baked by the sun. <laughs> 100%. As we've learned, a very well insulated building. Challenges present opportunities. You actually used the freed up the space that was freed up by these it added additional storage yes we did yeah, yeah yeah the original install had a 64 kilowatt battery attached to each inverter with the sunsync system you can actually cluster up to 10 batteries to one inverter so we took advantage of the extra space speaking to tim looking at tim's low profile as well where he could benefit from having extra storage with what's been produced we took advantage of that and suggested he had another three batteries so we've now got two batteries 384 kilowatts of battery storage split across three inverters 128 kilowatt hours on each inverter now. It was one of the first 50 kilowatt inverters from Sunsync that was installed. Great inverter. Installed on the roof are 432 solar modules, delivering a peak generation capacity of 146 kilowatts. So how does that integrate with the Sunsync hybrid inverters? You take one 50 kilowatt inverter and you dedicate that as a master inverter. This one is a master and then you create Modbus 1 and Modbus 2, which then become the slave inverters. The master inverter will read what everything else is doing and then that will be sent to the information on the Connect app, which will be giving you overall reading of what's being produced. You might be thinking, what's the story behind the batteries being outside? It's not just about space or convenience. Battery storage, obviously yes. insurance companies get a little bit nervous about batteries. They do indeed, yeah. When we spec a system, we have to notify insurance companies what we're putting in. Depends which insurance company you get. A lot of them will insist that the batteries are external. Particularly this one, that was one of the jurisdictions, hence why we've had to put the batteries externally in. So Neil, we're out in the garden shed. The individual 
batteries themselves, pretty similar to the ones people they probably do, yeah, seen they're, before. They're a 51 volt DC battery running series, so that adds up to 600 volts. I think you'd find if you stripped down a battery in a residential, you'd probably find a similar setup of individual cells. But that high voltage obviously keeps the size of the cabling back yes. to the inverter down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the box at the top there with the circuit breaker. So the box at the top is the battery management unit, so that basically controls what the batteries are doing from the inverter. It monitors the batteries as well temperature wise make sure that they are all balanced correctly which is really important a slight under voltage or, or unbalance causes a few issues but the bmu maintains and keeps that as it should do so say i've had an instance one of these packs was slightly overheating the bmu would shut down as a safety protocol we'd get a, an alarm monitor on our our connect app with the cell going down it's not something you could remotely do you'd have to physically come out and check mm -hmm. the cells but we can plug into the bmu and find out what cells come down and why and i guess these are lithium ion phosphate batteries are, yeah. which the lithium ion yeah so these are a life po4 so the chemical makeup of these batteries are, are slightly different so the thermal runaway isn't as great as it would be in a in a lithium ion battery well, watch out folks we've got a video coming out where we destroy not a sunsink battery but we picked a, a random battery and tried to destroy it it's well worth a watch of course it's not just about generating and storing energy the most efficient energy is the energy you don't need to produce at all back inside tim explains how they tackled that challenge it's all right generating the energy but we've done an awful lot in the business to reduce the energy that we need. So changing processes, looking at what temperature we set ovens at with those activities, in some cases in consultation with the customers, we've reduced our energy consumption pro rata about 20%. With the systems that we've set up, we're in a net zero building. You combine all that together, our carbon reporting on a product will be a lot less than a competitor who haven't gone down that particular route. Tim also explains how they've made energy use more visible across the business using data from the SunSync app to give everyone access to real-time insights. When we had the dealing with SunSync, we said, oh, can we have a display put up in the production facility so that the staff here, if they make a change, they can actually potentially see the immediate effect of that right. operation on the screen. So this is your real-time energy consumption? This is a real-time display from midnight last night through to 10... 25 now and we can see the state of charge on the batteries block in the middle there is when we charged up last night to 70 percent capacity on the batteries because apparently the weather forecast was saying today was going to be a little bit sunny and then our usage from eight o'clock this morning going through so we can see the demand on the system where the energy is being drawn from which is from the battery and then the solar impact as well there's if, a tiny orange line at the bottom of the grid input yeah since grid. eight o'clock this morning we've drawn the virtually nothing from the grid. It's January, February, March. Half of the power's coming purely from the solar yeah. itself. Yeah, and that, that was March. Yeah. With the extra batteries. Yeah, you've reduced the flexibility. The import was reduced by half. Alongside process improvements, there's also been a shift in how energy from the grid is managed, using it more flexibly and strategically. The reason for the storage was any excess either goes to the grid or if you haven't got the approvals, then switches off and it's a waste. So we said right, the energy that we're buying at night is cheaper than the cost during the day right. so we can either charge up at night and use that energy during the day yeah so it's about a third the, the purchase cost at night is a third less than during the day yeah and also low production periods mm -hmm. the sun is out we can store that energy and then use it when we want it. How much of your energy comes from the renewables? Based on this year, so January to April, which is a, a low sunny period, yeah. but it's already up at 40%. If we take those figures and project through for the year, generating more electricity in a year than we're actually using. We put the question to Tim and Neil, what would they say to other manufacturers ready to take on the energy challenge? The advice would be, first of all, check that your building's going to be suitable for putting solar panels on. Then the next stage would be then saying, if we put a plant in, how big is it going to be relative to what we're using? Mm -hmm. So you need to collect an awful lot of data 
to establish that you're not going to get a system which is going to be too big or worth still too small. What are you going to do with surplus energy that you're producing? Are you going to store it or are you going to sell it? With this day and age, trying to sell electricity is difficult. The other thing is about payback. For us, that's not an issue. It's all been self-funded. The reason about it's offsetting significant increases in electricity. So all this has to be calculated. There is a big difference between what's predicted, how much solar will you, you will be producing, as opposed to statistical. Mm. So you are taking a bit of a gamble with a small G. A lot of companies will sell an insulation based on roof space. My advice would be, you don't necessarily need your roof full of panels. It's designing a system that works for the client in mind based on their usage and consumption, rather than how much roof space you've got. This project has been a trailblazer for solar and battery storage in the UK, and it hasn't just benefited Airedale Springs. The insights gained here have played a key role in shaping SunSync's new power hub, a breakthrough drop-in solution for industrial energy storage. It streamlines system design, cuts installation time, and makes large-scale energy management more accessible than ever. There's a link with all the details in the description below. And if you're looking to take control of your energy costs, understand your electricity bills and explore solar for your own business, check out the video on screen now. It's full of practical advice to help you get started.